congratulations on this brand new album. It is an absolutely fantastic album, so congratulations. Uh, it's really nice of you to say I appreciate that. I, uh, I'm assuming that you guys are on a little bit of a lag, is that right? Probably, just because of the distance, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a little bit of a lag, but that's all alright. Uh, we, we're kind of used to it. So, I I wanted to ask you about this album. I understand that the what we've been going through the last couple of years with quarantines and things like that has been a, a huge influence on this album. Can you tell us a little bit about that influence, about the world around us on this album? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we released an album called Occam Spoil, uh, really more of an EP, five songs. And we put that out really sort of quietly in November of 2019. And I thought I might throw it to radio and a couple publicists, you know, just to see uh, if anybody cared. <laughs> we, Little King seems to make albums every four or five years. And, and so it's almost like starting over again every time we put out a record and you never know if people are going to come. And fortunately, um, people seem to really like it, which was cool. So as that, uh, as that record started to gain some momentum, as, as Vodka Spoil kind of got out into the world, um, we started to get some offers to play some festivals and play some states and even, you know, talking a little bit about going to Europe um, to do, you know, a, a set of 15 shows. Well, of course, best laid plans of Mice and Men, right? Uh, everything sort of imploded in March and in April. Um, and so... You know, we had, we had all these plans to go on tour. So instead of that, uh, I basically went back into the woodshed. I said, you know, I've got a lot of energy still as far as music is concerned. I figured that what I ought to do is maybe uh, maybe make another album. Uh, so that's what I did. And certainly, I think most of the best writing, whether it's music or whether it's literature or anything, is, you know, is at least born in, some, you know, in part from one's own personal experiences and one's own environment. And certainly... You know, that was a dominant theme for everybody in 2020 was what was going on and you know with uh, with the pandemic and so from my bed with my classical guitar locked up in my house watching uh, CNN or whatever uh, you know the internet or whatever social media I could doom scroll through I started to get the idea that hey maybe each of the songs of this set should uh, in some way relate to what my experiences were during quarantine and then you know subsequent to that hoping that people would be able to relate and as they have and as they are as, as these songs are starting to trickle their way out into the world. So, you know, the first song, Bombs Away, is really sort of an introduction to the album in terms of what was going on. Uh, you know, me personally and feeling isolated, literally starting to talk to the plants in the house because I had nobody else around for a good bit. And then, you know, from there, there's songs of, you know, the pitfalls of social media and domestic violence, which is always a, you know, which is always a problem but certainly seems to be exacerbated by the pandemic, people spending a lot of time with other um, you know, in their houses, and, and sobriety uh, is the theme of a song called "Set It Down," which is something that I, I'm going through at the time, and I've actually been sober for almost two years now, which is great. But it was, certainly was sort of a new endeavor for me in March and April of 2020. So, as I said, I thought I felt like if I was able to put my heart and soul into these songs, both musically and lyrically, that people would be able to relate. So now the album comes out September 3rd, and I guess uh, I guess we're going to put that theory to the test. Of, yeah, and the album's coming out while some countries in the world are still in lockdown. We're still in lockdown here at the moment. So do you think a lot of people who listen to this album while they're in lockdown will really be able to relate to what you're talking about on the album? I think so. I really do. I It's so interesting um, and bizarre and, and a little sad, to be honest with you, how differently everybody has been affected by this and how everybody's timelines have been so different. I mean, certainly here we're sort of back in the throes of the Delta variant and, and seeing how, you know, my son is actually a freshman in high school here in Arizona where I live, and uh, they just actually reinstituted a mask mandate today in the state of Arizona. Um, it was it, It's under a uh, knowledge, but at least for the time being, they got a temporary injunction or at least they're able to. So, you know, the, the infection rates here in the states have gone way back up. Um, you know, and I know other countries like yours, um, you know, like Australia and, and certainly places in Europe have, have already come back in the lockdown. I have a lot of friends in the UK as well who have gone through the similar thing. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, it's almost whiplash, which maybe should be the title of the follow-up album. It, it seems like you know, we felt like we were coming out, you know, coming out of this and everybody had access to vaccines, um, you know, pretty early here in the United States. I certainly was, was vaccinated myself in April and, 
And so we, we, I think we kind of felt like everybody's getting, getting, going to get the vaccine. We rounded the corner and things were going to get back somewhat to normal. Well, obviously that isn't the case. And so, yeah, I think people, uh, you know, I hope they're not sick of the, you know, sick of the theme. I don't know how you can get away from it though. It's certainly everywhere you turn in terms of school and in terms of news and things like that. So yeah, I think people will be able to relate to it. It's just unfortunate that, um, you know, the album was supposed to sort of be a, a you know, retrospective on what had happened in the quarantine and instead it, it, it looks like it's, it's current events again, which as I said, is, is very unfortunate, but it's, it's the world we live in and all we can do is just hope and pray that things get better and listen to doctors and listen to science and Certainly, I'm all in favor of making choices for one's own body and one's, you know, and, and, and one's own life. But by the same token, hopefully there's a consciousness of greater good and, and looking out for people who are less fortunate or maybe are immunocompromised and that people you know, do the right thing. And, and hopefully we can all get through this together. But I can't say that I'm inspired with a ton of confidence, at least in this country. It's, you know, COVID has turned into a political football and really has been here for the last 18 months. And, and again, I don't... Uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon, but it certainly is an unfortunate turn of events. Yeah, uh, exactly the same here. We have two major political parties here, Labour and Liberal, and every state was basically playing off each other. All the Labour states were doing it one way, and all the Liberal states were doing it another way, and um, yeah, it just became a, a huge political football here as well, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So, Ryan, I... Here, Dave, I mean, we, you know, the Republicans... Republicans and Democrats here are this, you know, same liberal who would be the Democrats, I suppose, the labor would be uh, the Republicans. And as you see the infections rising in the Republican states, we also call them the red states here in, in, in the U.S. Uh, the red states certainly have less vaccination rates. In fact, the top, or the bottom 10, I should say, vaccinated states are all Republican-controlled states. And most of them are in the southern, you know, what we call the south. And more, you know, there are a few out here in the west, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it really has become a political football, and in no uncertain terms, that was sort of led by the president and his administration, who really sort of took, took things in their own hands and sort of issued the best uh, available science. And kind of, you know, it, I don't know what the purpose is of dividing and conquering in this in this respect. You certainly see it a lot in politics, and fortunate thing. But uh, yeah, it, it, it sounds like that's probably the case in most in most countries, Dave. It's just this it's this division of uh, you know left and right and, and up and down and black and white, and right and wrong, and I, I don't understand why health, uh, you know, safety and health has to be something that we play politics with, but I guess, I guess, I guess that's the world we live in. Definitely. Hey Ryan, how did the, the pandemic affect how you recorded the album as well? Because you've got so many guests on this album, like David Hamilton, Christina. Yeah. How did that affect it? Because did that make it difficult to get those guests involved with the album? Not as much, Dave, as you might think. Honestly, the way it always has worked with Little King. Um, I mean, gosh, our first album came out in 1997, and, and you know, we've, as I said, been releasing albums off and on for you know, ever since. And so this is our seventh record. And the way the writing process has always worked for for me and for Little King has has been me sitting in a dark room with my acoustic guitar, <laughs> and that's really the genesis of most of our music. And so what happens is I write these songs and then I write them and rewrite them and edit them and then throw them out and then get mad at myself and then come back to them and, and do them again. And through the process of a lot of blood years, you know, I, I end up having these songs typically about 90% done musically. And, and then once that happens, I'm able to present them to the rest of the band. And the core of Little King, at least for the last couple of years and hopefully for the, you know, in, in perpetuity in the future is myself, you know, playing guitar and singing and then... Mandy Tejeda, who's my, one of my best friends, he lives back in Delaware. Um, I met him in my time back here on the East Coast. And he plays bass and sings backing vocals. And then Eddie Garcia is the drummer. And Eddie, uh, you know, in, in Overkill and Ministry and Pissing Raves, there's a bunch of other bands. Uh, he's a monster of a musician, Dave, but he's also a, an engineer and he owns a studio in Texas. So we always record down in Texas in El Paso. And so for me, it really didn't change things that much as that. Um, you know, I write the songs, I would send them to Manny, he would sort of fit his bass lines to them, we would do, the, do it virtually, or I would send him little snippets, little videos, and then, you know, the songs are basically all written musically in about May of last year, and so finally that's kind of when the, you know, the quarantine lifted in the States, and we, Manny and I were able to start getting together, you know, socially distanced and with masks, but, you know, jamming and working them out, but I must say that by the time I actually got together with him, those songs were basically all written musically, and so... We traveled down to Texas from Delaware, and, and actually I was in the process of moving back uh, west from the East Coast, so Manny and my son and I packed all of my crap and put it in a trailer and drove my truck from, from the East Coast down to the Southwest, and we stopped in 
and we recorded the bed tracks, so the bass uh, guitar and uh, all the drums, and then the guitars, at least the bed guitar, were all recorded in, in August and early September of 2020. And so once that's done, then it makes it easy because I've got some decent recordings, you know, the, of what it is that we've already done. And so at that point, I take the tracks home, I send them to Dave, who writes the strings. You mentioned David Hamilton. Um, and he and Christina are both in El Paso. Eddie lives in El Paso. Jessica Flores, who sang vocals on, um, on a song called How Could You, which is, you know, as I talked about, is a song about domestic abuse. And so all those folks live in El Paso. So really it was easy to, for me to just send them the tracks as they had kind of been half completed, you know, talk to them about how, you know, what I heard, but mostly just letting them write their parts and then rehearse them. And then as we went back to El Paso to finish up basically in January of 2021, you know, earlier this year, those folks were pretty much ready to go. And so we traveled back there. Um, quarantine had been lifted again, you know, in February, things were pretty, pretty mellow, kind of getting back to normal down in Texas. So from that standpoint, it didn't change things all that much in terms of how I write and how I present, how these folks contribute. I guess maybe we weren't actually able to get together in person as much as we were normally. That's certainly been the protocol for the last 24 years. But, um, you know, technology has made it so that, you know, at least these folks are able to contribute and able to bounce ideas off me and tell me that, tell me that I'm crazy or tell me that I suck. <laughs> and that has just as much power virtually as it does in person. So, you know, at the end of the day, it didn't really, it didn't really affect it too much. But uh, I'm certainly pleased with the results. And obviously, I'm working, um, working with some great professionals who are far better musicians than I am. And that, that always makes things easy as well. Yeah, oh, it is an absolutely fantastic album. And I have to ask, I'm looking at a photo of the band right now. Who is the Brooklyn supporter? Because I'm a Brooklyn supporter as well. <laughs> Funny story, Dave. That's actually me. Uh, <laughs> Pre tattoos. I got. I actually got. A, I got a bunch of tattoos right after that. So I'm getting towards a pretty big birthday milestone. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but uh, needless to say, I was born in the early '70s. So um, I uh, I took that picture, and then after that, I actually tat- got tattoos all over my arms um, and my legs of every every piece of uh, a piece of artwork from every album that I released. So I've actually got seven tattoos. Actually, a few more. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was just before I'd done that. But anyway, Brooklyn is, um, it was one of my teams, but I own about 50 NBA jerseys. They have a collector. Actually, in the, in the video, Bombs Away, I don't know if you've seen that video yet or not. We released it about 10 days ago. But uh, I'm wearing a ton of different NBA jerseys. So I've got a huge collection of them. Brooklyn was the one that I was wearing that day. With, you know, Kyrie Irving is one of my favorite basketball players. And that's number 11. That's Kyrie Irving for Brooklyn. But, yeah, I grew up playing basketball. I'm a massive fan. Uh, basketball fan and, and obviously in all sports in general but particularly the nba so yeah that's me <laughs> that's my ball head and my uh, and my nba jersey and i mean we're a pretty funky looking band man I don't know if we're fairly disparate in terms of the look all three of us carry around at the end of it uh, somehow it works and we all get along so so there it is but yeah funny question today that's That'd be me in the Brooklyn jersey. <laughs> and we've all got a bit of a close connection to Kyrie, because of course Kyrie was born here in our hometown, Melbourne, Australia. So, yeah, lots of Brooklyn fans here now. That's right. Well, mate, to finish up, we are going to play Bombs That's Away. Right. Yeah, he was. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I remember that, that Kyrie was born in Australia, and, and... Actually, he's Australian, too, and he plays for uh, for the Utah Jazz. Um, and actually, a guy that I grew up with is a Utah Jazz coach. So, Quinn Snyder was a good friend of mine growing up and actually lived across the street from me and played basketball with me and basically taught me the game. So, yeah, I, I follow Joe pretty closely, too. I know I, I know that team really well as well. Yeah, definitely. Now, mate, we are going to play Bombs Away on the show right now. So what would you like to say to all of the people out there before they listen to this amazing track and also before they go out and grab a copy of the album as well? Yeah, I appreciate that. So Bombs Away is the first song on the album. Um, As I said, we just released a a video about 10 days ago. It actually has almost 60,000 views in 10 days. So people seem to really be liking it, really taking to it. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. But it really is... An introduction to the theme of the album of being, and it's just sort of from the perspective of me sitting back and watching the world disintegrate. And uh, I think it's fairly progressively, you know, not too much all over the place, but I'm really proud of the song, I'm really proud of the recording, and certainly the playing um, from my bandmates. Manny's got a couple little bass parts in there, and Eddie's drums all the way through are just incredible. So hopefully people like it and people dig it, and uh, and they can certainly find it online on YouTube as well as, uh, you know, it'll be available on Spotify and iTunes and everywhere else uh, come September 3rd. 
Awesome. Well, Ryan, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you, and uh, hopefully one day we get to see you guys even play in Australia.